Today we're going to focus on the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Anybody know what the word passion means, especially in the Latin root of it? Does anybody have an idea? Say it out loud if you know what a passion means in Latin. A lot of coughing. It's kind of close. <laughs> it means, in the Latin root, comes from, I think this is how you say, pati. It's the, to endure, to suffer. Yeah? Yeah, pati is also how we get the word like patience. Sometimes you see in the Bible patience being translated to long-suffering or compassion. Really, it's just not seeming just having empathy on somebody. It's like to suffer with somebody is what it means. Yeah? So that, that's really the word passion. And when we look at this week and you hear the word passion week, that means it's about the week that Jesus suffered, and Jesus suffered for us. And that's our focus today in our message entitled, what it's entitled is to be sin for us, to sin for us. Uh, I want to begin with our sword drill. This is something we do on Integrate Sunday. Sword drill. What is our sword? It is the Bible. Yeah, because the Bible, the Bible tells us that God's Word is like a sword, it's living and active, right? So if you brought your Bible, youth, if you brought your Bible, children, if you just raise up your swords, let me see your swords. I've asked you to bring this every first Sunday, at the very least, if not every week. Okay, we're going to do sword drill. This is for you guys who are children and youth. If you have a hard copy of the Bible, I'm going to reveal a verse, and then you're going to look it up. If you have a Korean Bible, English Bible, Aramaic Bible, Spanish Bible, doesn't matter. Yeah, whatever language. You find it, and then the first one to find it and stands up, you're to read it out loud, and then we'll give you a wonderful, join you with a wonderful praise for God for his word. Okay? So, ready? Here is the verse. Matthew 26, 2. Go. 26, 2. I'm looking around. Raise your hand if you find it. If you find it. Oh, Timothy's. Oh, you, you got it? Okay, stand up. As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Thank you very much. Yes. This is from Thailand. Crispy mango. Well done. Yes. Matthew 26, 2, as Timothy read for us, as you know, the Passover is two days away. And the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Matthew 26 is where we're going to be in today, as well as um, chapter 27. We're going to skip through this week's reading for those of you who are following with us each and every week is Matthew 26 and 27, as well as John chapter 18 and 19. I encourage you to read that with us this week here in Passion Week. So... Those were the words of Jesus we just read. It's two days before the Passover, one of the most important times in the Jewish calendar for the Jewish people. That's something we're going to come back in a moment. And it's during this time Jesus said that he was going to be handed over to be crucified. But here's the thing. The disciples, even though Jesus said this again and again and again, they didn't really get it. They didn't really understand what they meant that he would be crucified. We do because we have, praise God, the, the word of God that helps us understand this. And God's word tells us that Jesus was handed over to be crucified to be sin for us. That's the message title and also our Bible quote for, for today. So let's read that. Verse, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to read in verse 21. God made Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This one verse holds such truth, comprehensive truth, of what the gospel really is all about. Just this one verse shows us the beauty of the whole gospel, why Jesus was crucified on the cross, to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God. 
which is actually impossible for us. We, we cannot, as human beings, become the righteousness of God because we are the furthest thing from the righteousness of God. Why? Because simply of our sin. And here's one way the Bible defines sin. So let's go to our first point. We're going to go into our sermon notes. If you have one of those, you can fill that out together to track with each one and through the message here. Everyone who sins breaks God's law. Everyone who sins breaks God's law. This is a One of the definitions that the Bible gives to us of what sin is, right? 1 John 3, 4. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law, for all sin is contrary to the law of God. All sin is opposite to God's law. So everything that you do that is sinful is in complete opposition to God's rule and His rules. And here's the thing we need to understand, that we need to share with people, and if we don't have an understanding, we really need to understand it. Breaking God's law is not a small matter. Breaking God's law is a life and death matter, because here's the thing, it's an offense against God. And that is very important. Who the offense is against is the most important thing. How many of you guys have brothers or sisters? I have a brother. Yeah, you got brothers and sisters. How many of you guys fight with your brothers and sisters? A few of you? Okay. Well, we all know that hitting and hurting somebody else is wrong, right? But how many of you have hit or hurt your brother or sister? Yeah, I got to admit that too. I've done that in the past. We can have, perhaps in the past, and I want to show a little slide of here of, of maybe some siblings fighting right? And hurting each other. I remember when I was a kid with my brother, we would actually sit on chairs and just squeeze each other's faces and pinch each other. I actually have scars on my face because of my brother's sin against me. But hopefully you got some consequences. Your parents gave you some consequences for that. Maybe took away your dessert, grounded you, time out, whatever it is, because that should happen. But how many of you actually served jail time because you hit your brother or sister? Anybody? Nobody? Oh, I'm thankful. But that's probably not ever has really happened. But here's a little bit different situation. What if you did the same thing to, say, one of our bus drivers? What if we, as people as we were riding on the public bus, ended up hitting one of those bus drivers. What's the consequence for that? Take away your ice cream? (laughs) No, that's a bigger deal. In fact, here in Korea, the law has it to where if you do that, you're in big trouble. It's not only a fine, you can go to jail. In fact, in the last two years, several people have gone to jail because they hit a bus driver here in Korea. Yeah, and they serve jail time. It's a big deal. The same thing that you would do to your sibling, if you do to a bus driver, definitely a big consequence. Let's change it up a little bit more. What if you did the same thing to the president of the Republic of Korea? And you went up to him and you went, bam! Jail time? Oh, definitely jail time. And in some countries, it's a sentence of death. Remember Queen Esther? She was the queen. And she risked her life because she was going to step into the king's presence without his permission. And it was a risk because if she did that, she could have died. Sentence of death. Same action, same deed, same wrongdoing, But who you do it against is what matters. And the higher the authority, the higher the consequence. And guess who the highest authority of all of this world and the universe is? Is God. And so sin is breaking God's law, and it's a direct offense of 
God. And the Bible tells us the wages of sin, that's why it is death. When we sin, it automatically you deserve, we deserve the death penalty. And not all, only that, your sins, my sins always lead to death. That's why in the next verse of Matthew 26, we will see these so-called godly people of the day, religious leaders, who are supposed to be obeying God's law, <laughs> plotting to kill and commit murder. Let's read this in Matthew 26, 3 through 4. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas, and they schemed to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. These are godly, so-called godly people who are to obey God's law, and they're going to break one of God's law and a very serious one as that. Here's a quiz for you. Just see if you guys remember the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder is which number commandment? You remember? Is it the third, fourth, fifth, or sixth commandment? Who says the third commandment? Who says the fourth, fifth, sixth? Wow, good job. That is the correct answer. It is the sixth commandment. And it says, God says, you shall not murder. But this is exactly what the chief priests and these religious leaders are going to do. Everyone who sins breaks God's law. And because we break God's law, not only is it a broken of our, the law of God, it also breaks Irre irreparably a relationship with God as well. It's broken. No fixing that. And this is a forever separation. It says in Isaiah 59 two, but your iniquities, sins, have made a separation between you and your God. The separation is not just, hey, I, I can get closer whenever I want. No, this is a forever separation. That's why hell exists. And this is why God the Father sent His one and only Son to become sin for us so that we could be forgiven of our sins through what Jesus did for us. However, in order to fully understand this, people of God, we need to understand what God was trying to teach us as his people through the Old Testament. And this is what we've been doing through the Gospel Project, hasn't, haven't we? We've been going through the Old Testament and learning about how that all brings it back to Jesus. So let's, this will be a little bit of a review for some of you, but we need to understand this before we get into Passion Week fully to understand what God was teaching his people through the Old Testament about their sin and what forgiveness would require. And it's simply this. This is your next point. Forgiveness requires bloodshed. It requires bloodshed. It says in Hebrews 9.22, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There is no forgiveness without shedding of blood. And that's why you see in the Old Testament, God provided a way of forgiveness through animal sacrifices. Animal sacrifices. True or false question here. In the Old Testament, God provided one other way for people to receive forgiveness of sins without the need for animal sacrifices. True or false? True? False? False. Answer is false. That was the, in the Old Testament, that was the only way that God provided for actually the forgiveness of sins and goes back to what we saw here in Hebrews because there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. So he provided animal sacrifices. But why animals? Have you ever seen a lamb, like a baby lamb and a goat? Oh, they're so cute. In fact, we, we had a chance with my girls to go um, look at these baby goats. One of our friends had a baby goat, and they were able, and I want to show a quick little video of that. These are precious little goats. <laughs> They actually sound like kids when they cry, right? They're just so adorable, so cute, and they had such a wonderful time with them. So what do you think? It's, it's just animals just like this, goats and lambs, that 
they would, God said, to use for the sacrifices, to, to kill them. So why animals? What did they do wrong? Did they do anything wrong? No. That's the point. That's the point. Since animals did no wrong, they died in the place of the one who's offering the sacrifice. And so this innocent life, and it being slaughtered, and the blood that flows from it, shows us not only the seriousness of our sin, but what's required to pay for it. In Leviticus chapter 16, God instructed the high priest to get two unblemished, meaning those kinds of animals without any kind of, mis um, what do you call a blemish? I, mean, I guess it's like some kind of spot on it. It just was perfect. And it represented a sinless life. That's what it represented, a sinless life. And he instructed them, to, uh, the high priest to get two unblemished male goats. And he was to take one, kill it, slaughter it, shed its blood, showing that this is what sin costs. It's a death of an innocent life, and that's what's required for the payment of their sin. That's what's called atonement. If you hear the word atonement, it simply means this life is paying for your sin. What you deserve, this life is paying for it. Okay? And here's why. Here's Leviticus chapter 17. For the life of a creature is in the blood. Did you know that? If you take out all your blood, are you living? No. The life of the creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood of that makes atonement for one's life, makes the payment for your life. Now, here's the thing about the second goat. It was called the, I can't pronounce this, Azazel goat. It just simply means the goat that departs or the goat that disappears. And here, God was revealing something far beyond simply the payment of the debt of sin which was in itself very, very significant and huge, right? Just the payment for another innocent life to pay for our sins is big, but then he was showing another part of his plan through this second goat. And it's not only dealing with the consequence of sin, but sin itself. Now we're understanding how serious sin is, right? But he's talking about now how to deal with the sin itself. So once the high priest made atonement for himself and the people, he took that goat, okay? And he took the second goat, he laid his hands on the head of this goat. And do you know what he did? He confessed his own sin and the sins of all the people. And it represented all the sins of the people of God being transferred onto this goat, and then he would take this goat, and they would all go with him, to an uninhabitable land in the wilderness, meaning a place that wasn't livable by any living creature. And they would release this goat into this land, into this wilderness, alone, alive, to die, and so their sins could never find its way back to them. That this goat would literally carry away their sins and be gone forever. It's not just a payment of, it's a carrying away of their sins. This is a very powerful living picture that God provided not only the payment, but the removal of our very existence of our sins. Hope you're catching that. And that's why in Psalms 103, the psalmist says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. These two goats, these two sacrifices together showed us a fuller picture of what God had in his heart to do. To provide payment and atonement for our death penalty, but also to 
carry away our very sins through a perfect sacrifice that would bear our sins upon itself to be sent out completely alone to die so that our sins would never find its way back to us. Wow. And that sacrifice would be, here's your next point, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the world. Remember that this week of Passion Week was the week of Passover. You guys remember what Passover was all about? It was the week where they celebrate their freedom, God's deliverance of His people from slavery and death. And it was the very week that Jesus, the Lamb of God, would be sacrificed. Did you know God's timing is absolutely perfect? Absolutely perfect. In fact, the Bible says this was the fullness of time. This was the right time for God's plan to happen. And Jesus even prayed that, Father, the hour has come for your Son to be glorified. This Passover week where they're celebrating what God has done in the past was going to be something God was going to show them what He was going to do for all of eternity. But many people missed this then. They didn't put it together. They didn't understand and they didn't remember when John the Baptist said this very statement when Jesus came and approached John the Baptist he cried out, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you hear the meaning of that? Who takes away, who carries away the sin of the world. Hopefully now you can understand the gravity of what this means for us, but also what this meant for Jesus as He was journeying to the cross. He who had no sin would become sin for us. The transfer of all of the world's sin would be upon goats were simply just representations, pictures, a shadow of what Jesus was about to do, the real, the actual thing of removing our sins forevermore. And that's why in Matthew 26, here in the next few verses, it says this thought, this reality overwhelmed him with sorrow to the point of death. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane hours before he would be arrested. Matthew 26, 38-39. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he tells his disciples, stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus, who knew no sin, he never sinned in his life, and he knew no sin. God would make him sin for us. All the sins of the world be transferred upon Him, upon the Holy One of God. That means it's like if somebody said, here is a bowl of poison. I want to pour this all into your mouth, down into your very being. How would you think that would make you feel? You are not made for poison. Poison will kill you immediately. But this is not even a close illustration to where I can help you understand the Holy One of God would become sin for us. And this brought Jesus to great sorrow. Powerful. He sweated with stress, with drops of blood. That's how sorrowful he was. And he fell to his face on the ground, and he prayed, Father, called him Abba. It's similar to like in Korean, Abba. Abba, if it is possible, 
If there is any other way for your will to be accomplished, for this removal of sin for the people that we love to happen, if there's any other way, may this cup be passed from me. You know what that cup represented? And the Bible shows us the cup represents the wrath of God. Intended for sin. And Jesus would take the full wrath of God for us. And could you see this powerful scene here in the garden where I, you know, Jesus is asking. This is the Son of God. Don't ever think Jesus being the Son of God was just invincible. He was not. He was fully God and He was fully human. And the anguish and the pain that he experienced about the coming thing that was about to happen, that he was to be sin for us, pained him so much, he asked his Abba, if there's any other way to remove this cup from him. And as a dad, if my children was to ask in pain and in anguish to take away this very thing that was going to cause them such horror. That would hurt my heart more than anything. But here's the thing. The answer is, there is no other way. If there was another possible way, yes. Yes, but there is no other possible way. And so Jesus said, and not as I will. You will. If you have ever doubted the love of God, all you have to do is look to the cross to see that God loves you. That He sent His one and only Son because He so loved the world. And Jesus laid down His life willingly. He says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. And he did it because he loves you. There's a part of him that didn't want to do this thing the only way. But he did it willingly. Because it was the only way to remove our sins from us. Jesus requested this three times. And yet three times he said, Father, not as I will but as you will. Soon after that, Jesus was then arrested, betrayed by one of his very own, and then he appears before the religious leaders who falsely accuse him. They spit on him. They slap him. They punch him in the face with their fists, and they condemn him to die. They believe he is worthy of death. And that very next morning from the Garden of Gethsemane, the chief priests bring Jesus to Pilate. Pilate is a governor, the Roman governor of the land who has the actual authority, the real authority, to sentence somebody to prison, to sentence somebody to death. And so that's why the high priest bring him before Pilate. Pilate talks with Jesus and he sees no fault in him. He sees nothing wrong in Jesus. He sees absolutely no reason to sentence This man called Jesus to death. So he doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to do, but he remembers a Jewish tradition. Something that happens in Israel around this time of Passover that could possibly solve this issue. In fact, he might be feeling smart. (laughs) He could use this to save some face for himself, save the face for those who are around him, each Passover, the people are able to ask for the freeing of one prisoner as a symbolic act to remember God's merciful delivering of his people from their bondage in Egypt. That's what the purpose of this tradition was to be. And so Pilate gives them a choice, Barabbas or Jesus. And do you know who Pilate was thinking that the crowd would choose? Jesus! Because there was no fault in him. 
Do you know who Barabbas was? The Bible tells us, gives us pretty good understanding of Barabbas. Barabbas was a notorious, well-known prisoner. He was a rebel, he was a robber, and he was a murderer. The contrast was huge. This is a clear criminal. The worst of the worst who deserves to die. This guy says some stuff but find no faults. So who do you want to free, Barabbas or Jesus? And the crowd cries out, we want Barabbas. Barabbas. Listen to this. Verse 21 and chapter 27. Which of these two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governors. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who's called the Messiah? Peliah asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. The crowd's choice obviously surprised Pilate. Have you ever thought about how Barabbas might have felt? Now, being a notorious criminal, a well-known criminal, he was probably locked up not too far from where all this was happening, but in the belly, deep underground, in a secure location. He probably couldn't hear what Pilate was saying because Pilate is just one voice far away, but he could definitely hear the roar and the sound of the crowd. And so when basically Pilate asked, who shall I release to you? Barabbas probably didn't hear that. All they heard was the crowd saying, Barabbas! Then Pilate asked to them, No, what shall I do with Jesus who was the Messiah? Barabbas didn't probably hear that. All they heard was, Barabbas, crucify him! And louder, crucify him! And louder, and Pilate's saying, What shall I do here? And they let his blood be on our hands and our children's hands. That's what probably Barabbas was hearing. And so no matter how hard of a criminal Barabbas was, as he came out, do you think he knew and do you think he had some emotions knowing that he was going to be crucified? Because he saw crucified people all around him. But then he walked out and all he could see was this man Jesus who was going to take his place for him. Barabbas was the first person that knew what it meant for Jesus to take his place as a criminal on the cross. And he was a free man. Did he deserve it? No. no. But Jesus did it. Have you ever thought how Barabbas would have felt? Well, you don't have to think about it anymore because we are Barabbas. We are Barabbas. And Jesus took our place. Barabbas was the guilty one. He was the criminal. He was the murderer. He's the one who deserved to die. Did Jesus take his place? as the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Remember, not only to pay the debt of sin, but to take away the sin of the world. Why? So that we could be truly reconciled to God. That's the only way to be reconciled to a holy God is so that there is a complete removal of your sin because God cannot united with sin. And so, here's what God was doing in Christ. Here's your last point. God in Christ reconciled the world to Himself. The relationship we catastrophically broke with our sins, with our iniquities that separated us from God, here in this moment on the cross, it says in 2 Corinthians 5.19, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Amen. 
no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. This is what I'm preaching to you right now. This message of reconciliation. Everything that we broke because of our sin, God in Christ was reconciling to himself. Sin broke this world. Our sin broke this world. Our sin breaks our relationship with God. Our sin breaks us. We're broken because of sin. But God is putting it all together in Christ. The nails that pierced the hands of God that hung and united Jesus Christ to the cross is what now unites us together with God. The nails that were used for something horrible, God has used to do something wonderful. The blood that came down that covered all of that wood is the very blood that takes the charges of our sins against us and covers it completely white as and so and cancels it completely against us. But here's the thing, in order to bring us together and reconcile us to God, Jesus had to be sent out alone with our sins to die. Do you remember that second goat? Listen to this part, Matthew 27, 45, 46. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came all over the land. And about three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you remember Jesus sent to become sin for us? That means he became sin for us. And for the first time in all of eternity, the triune community of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit knew and experienced in Christ, there on the cross, iniquities that made separation between us and God. Some of you, kids, you've never experienced separation from your mom and dad. But what if you were to experience for the first time ever being alone, without your parents, by yourself? That would be a horrible thing, but it's infinitely more horrible what happened here. That God in Christ actually experienced separation from God. Listen to that. It takes a little while. God in Christ, there on the cross, experienced separation from God. You see, you've got to understand that salvation, God's salvation is not something God's way up there and He looks down here and says, you're in danger of sin and death. I'm going to pluck you out of its danger. There you go. Now go live on with your life. No, it is almighty, all-powerful God who becomes weak human being to participate in our sufferings, to become sin for us, to experience our separation from God in every single way that every human being has experienced, to know intimately so that He could pay the penalty that we needed to pay so that we'd be free men like Barabbas and be removed from all sin so we can be reconciled to God forevermore. That is the God we worship. This is Jesus, our suffering Christ. Some misheard Jesus and thought he was calling for Elijah when he said, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, offered it for Jesus to drink. Not too long after that, Jesus cries out again, Matthew 27, 50. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And in other parts of the Gospels, we know what exactly what Jesus said. He cried out, it is finished. A cry of not of defeat, but of complete victory and fulfillment of the Father's plan, of, the, of God's plan 
long ago for the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. And when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God was not silent. He actually responded. Did you know that? Not audibly with words, but He responded in a much powerful and significant way. Verse 51. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. <laughs> God spoke. You see, for God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sin against Him. And this tear of the temple curtain that separated, that separated holy God from sinful people, at the moment of Jesus' death, God tore into two, saying, because of what my son has done for you, come. 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 Be reconciled. Be reconciled. It's finished. Come. That is the gospel. A difference. And through the Gospel Project, we've been sharing with our kids, and I want to share with you now how to become a Christian. How to take what you heard today and say, God, I want to follow you. I want to do something because of what I've heard. And here's God's plan. Here's very simple steps. First one is to understand that God rules. Like we talked about, God rules because He created. He is creator. Guess what? The creator gets to rule. <laughs> he made all things. And He made the rules. Right? But we broke the rules. That's the next part. We sinned. And that sin automatically deserves a death penalty. We saw that because it's a sin against God. The highest authority in all of the universe. But God didn't leave us alone there. He provided. He provided a way. The only way. Jesus said, if there's any other way, there is no other way. This is the only way. And God provided that way through Jesus. And what Jesus has done is He gave His life for you. And not only gives His life on the cross for you, next week we're going to see that He has given us his life of righteousness. He became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. And so what's all that's left is for every sinner to respond. And we simply do that by saying, Jesus, thank you. When somebody gives you something, the best thing you can say is thank you. That's how you receive it. Thank you for what you've done. I confess to you that I am a sinner. I have sinned against you and I deserve death. Just as I heard today. But I don't want that. I want what you have provided. And I heard that Jesus, you died for me. That it's your blood that gives me forgiveness. And I accept this. I confess to you that you are Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, who died and was raised again for me. And the Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess that with your mouth, you shall be saved. It's for His amazing love. Amazing love. As we were singing that, I just had in my heart to speak to somebody here who may have been feeling God's been far away. He's, you're feeling that He's been very quiet. And that verse really stood out to me. I'm forgiven because he's been, He was forsaken. Jesus experienced that separation, that silence, that forsakenness. And He knows what you're going through. And He loves you. And He invites you 
And he wants you to look to the cross to be able to know his wonderful love for you. I, I believe that you will experience in greater measure, greater measure.